So we're moving moving on to the final session on uh, modeling and tracing, and the speaker is uh, Lenka Zdeborova uh, from CNRS and, and CAS Aclay, and she's a fellow of uh, ELIS, but not of the health program, but thanks to these workshop series, she has started to work on health-related topics, so I'm extremely eager to hear what she has to say. Lenka, take it away. Okay, thank you, Guido. I will try to share the screen as everybody else to go to my slides. Um, are you seeing my slides? Yes. Anybody? Okay, great. So, so yes, thanks for for organizing this because indeed, you know, I want to tell you about uh, about COVID risk estimation from contact tracing data. Uh, something that I have started to work on exactly five weeks ago on the evening of the first LS COVID workshop after reaching out to Joshua Benjo and asking him about what he was talking about in his talk. And after the second LS COVID uh, workshop, I reached to another speaker of that one, Luca Ferretti, who, who, who is working on related topics and we got some really nice realistic contact networks from him. So you will see, see those. So, ah, okay, so now how do I switch to my next slide? Sorry. Uh, oh, okay. I just, okay, now it's working. So, contact tracing data, what the apps that a lot of people are discussing uh, should be collecting is, or storing at the, at the phone, is information about individuals. So, this can be their age, their syndromes that they have at any given moment, or other health rela related risks, such as maybe those that Uri was mentioning. And then the information about contacts between individuals. So, that should go to both the phones of both the contacts. And this will include the time at which the contact happened, the duration of the contact, ideally the distance during the contact. And also some information about barriers, barrier measures that were used, for instance, if one of the person uh, used a mask or, or things like that. So the contact tracing that all of you surely read about and heard about as, as discussed currently is doing the following. It, you know, up and a positive, so, so, so it's collecting that information on the phone and up, up and a positive test of an individual his or her recent and sufficiently close and sufficiently long contacts are contacted and either tested or advised to be tested or advised to be self-isolated. That depends on the, on the whole, whole system. So this, you know, how this is working and how this is uh, advantages for the whole epidemic problem. This was something that Luca Ferretti covered at that talk um, uh, at the second COVID Alice. I'm giving you the link uh, to, to his uh, working paper on this or with many other authors. So by the way, the slides, they are available on the, on the GitHub web page that will be linked on several of the slides so you can get all the links easily from there. So this is something from, from our rounds, but it's very much in line with uh, what, uh, what Luca was showing in his talk. That's how the contact tracing is advantages to actually co uh, control the epidemic. So what I'm showing you here in the dashed broken black line, that's an uncontrolled epidemic on a graph of here it is 10,000 individuals, you know, on the right, you have the, the set of parameters. So that's completely uncontrolled epidemic. The, the blue line, that's an epidemic where I randomly test individuals I also test individual, I also test uh, half of the symptomatic cases and those cases that I found positive, I set them into quarantine. I isolate them from the rest of the network. So if I do that isolation, then I you know, flatten the peak and, and, and lower the peak and flatten the curve. And then the orange curve, that's the result of the contact tracing where instead of the, the additional tests to the symptomatic ones, instead of doing them at random, I do them based on the contact tracing. So who was the one that was most often in contact with, with people that before were tested um, infected? So that's the effect on the epidemics. It's, you know, this is some example, but it, is, it can have a big effect. It can completely flatten the curve just by doing that. And so, can we do better than just the tracing? So, so, so at which point better? So we call that the smart inference of people at risk. 
So there is much more information in this data that the app uh, is collecting than just the list of contacts. You should actually take into account the fact that individuals, their risk is given also by, you know, it doesn't have to be that one of their their neighbors was tested positive, but if everybody is, is computing their risks, then the increased risks of their neighbors is increasing their own risks. So this should be self-consistently taken into account. And this is what, you know, what we are doing, what I will be telling you about, and what is needed from the app on top of what they are already planning to do or doing most of them is simply communication between the individuals who have been in contact. So this can be done at the moment of the contact with some broad, uh, with, with some low bandwidth, uh, in some low bandwidth manner via the Bluetooth, for instance, before connecting actually the Bluetooth to each other. Or it can be done later after the contact through some encrypted communication through a server. And again, only a very small bandwidth is needed to do that. So this should not be overloading the network. So as far as we found out or know, there are only two of, there are many of the apps currently being developed, but only two of them were actually, as far as we know, uh, they are trying to estimate the risks in a more advanced manner than just who has been in contact with somebody who tested positive. And this is on the one hand, exactly what Joshua Benja was talking about. So the app being developed in Canada by his team and another one called Viatrace uh, that is being um, deployed in India. So in our work, kind of where we position ourselves is to provide and test and validate the algorithm to actually uh, estimate those risks. So we work with three uh, algorithmic approaches. One of them, the simplest one, the mean field risk estimation, I will describe. And the um, other one, I will tell how they differ uh, after I describe the simplest one. So. So here I just remind you the SIR model for epidemic spreading that by now you know all, all of you all of you have heard about for sure. Uh, here by the SIR model, I am not meaning really the one differential equation that describes the whole population at once. I really we, we use it at the at the level of the individuals and the contact network between them. So every individual has a state, and what is crucial. Here is the lamb the, the crucial parameters here is the lambda ij as it of the time, which is the time dependent at attack rate, which is a probability that if node j was infected, that at time t it would actually infect node i if they were in contact. And the value of this lambda j is actually estimated from the duration and the distance of the contact and the barrier measures. And the other parameter in the model is the recovery rate. So that is when you are infected, what is the probability that you turn to recover? And then what we are interested is in is actually the probability of a person to be in one of these three states. And we will denote those for person I, the P of S being susceptible, infected, or removed, recovered at time T. Oh, sorry, I always, I moved that, but now I don't know how to go to my next slide. Why is this not working? Uh, okay, that's the next slide, great. So if we knew these probabilities at time t, then a pretty intuitive way to recompute them at the next time is the following. So the probability to stay susceptible will be the probability that I was susceptible at the previous time step minus sum over all the contacts I had at that time of what? Of the probability that I was susceptible, that I met the, the, my contact was infected and times this attack rate that is the probability that the infection was passed. The second equation, how does the probability of being recovered evolve, is simply the probability that I was recovered before, so I only stay recovered, and I add the mu times the probability that I was infected. And the third equation is simply, you know, these probabilities might add up to one, must add up to one, so I take one minus the first minus the second. And these are pretty intuitive. What they do not include yet, and when there is the most information kind of in this contact tracing, is actually the results of the tests or eventually the symptoms. 
So to take those the tests into account, we implement uh, the, the following feedback loop. So this slide is a little bit busy, but if you go to the um, uh, to the links there, you will you know you can sit with it in calmly. But what it does is that the moment somebody tests infected, we estimate this person was already infected for tau steps before that. And so we go back those tau, uh, tau steps and set the probability of that person being infected to one, and then recompute, rerun the message passing forward in time to the present time. And this takes into account pro uh, properly the, the, the fact that somebody was infected. So, so, so here, you know, to, just to say how these two other algorithmic approaches that we are using differ from that. So the dynamical message passing does some somewhat fewer approximations than what I have seen you shown you uh, is doing. And the third approach, the belief propagation of our collaborators uh, from Torino, is actually looking at the probabilistic model that properly conditions to the dynamics to the observations. So this feedback loop is much less ad hoc in that approach. And these are actually approaches that you know both the, the, the collaborators from Torino and us have worked on, say, five years ago. And back then, kind of, the, you know, the referees were saying, yeah, but you don't have the contact network. And you were saying, yeah, we know, but it's still interesting. But now, I mean, we can, you know, at least locally, the phones could have the contact. So here I start to show some results of that. So this is just the sanity check that the probability estimation we are you know, computing actually agrees with what would have been happening if you ran the dynamics, uh, the SIR dynamics many times. And you know, being on the straight X line means that it works. So this would be without the feedback loop because without the feedback loop, we can easily do the Monte Carlo dynamics and check. So this is just saying you know, it works. And here I'm showing you some of the, you know, in epidemiology, the rock curves are, are often used. So what these curves are is that when you have a method to estimate the probability of a, of a risk of somebody, then you rank those probabilities, start with the highest one. And if it is a true positive, you go up. And if it is a false positive, you go, you go to the right. And then you go on until you exhaust your whole population. And if your ranking was just random, you will do something, some random work like the blue line in this figure. So this is not very good. But if you rank using the tracing, which is the orange line, you will do, you know, you will be higher and higher is better. And if you rank using our approach, you are even higher. And this is for instance on a on a on a graph that is you know that was provided to us by by Luca Ferretti that comes from Dermal. Uh, run by Rob Hinch and you know that I link that I referenced uh, previously. So now the same graph on a slightly different network, but still still provided from the realistic epidemiolo epidemiologic model by by Hinch et al. Where now I compare to the approach of our collaborators from from Torino, so so Brownstein et al. And I link here their, their GitHub um, notebooks where, where you can reproduce all, all those graphs. You can directly go to the notebooks and see how exactly they were obtained. To show you there is additional space for improvement if you use their approach. So that's the orange curve that is even higher. So, so this is really exciting. This, this seems to be quite powerful method. And it's slightly more expensive in terms of the bandwidth that you need to send the messages between the phones. But it's a kind of trade-off that we need to explore, like whether it, the gain is big enough for this to be worthy eventually. And on this slide, I am showing you, you know, this is this is the figure that you have or, that I have already shown at the beginning when I was explaining the tracing is flattening the curve and moving the peak. And here I added the green curve, which is what happens if we actually rank not according to the tracing, but according to our method. So you see that the peak is lowered and the epidemic basically is, is completely diminished much before it would be if you were not doing tracing at all. And also even better than if you are just doing the naive contact tracing where you just contact the people that were in contact with somebody infected. And this is um, the same thing on, uh, uh, now this is supposed to be a video. Yeah, that works. So this is, um, the same kind of a control of the epidemic on again one of relatively big graphs. So this is 50,000 individuals 
from the mal that is uh, that is from the epidemiologic mal by by Hinz and Ferretti. And here I am showing you what happens if you are testing more and more individuals. So here I'm testing half of the infected people. I assume those have symptoms serious enough that they actually go to have a test. And additionally to that, I test a given number, so 50, 100, 200, or 400 of individuals according to the ranking. So the black curve is the uncontrolled epidemic. That's, that's there for comparison. The green is if the ranking, sorry, the blue is if the ranking is random. So you see that it's going down if I test more and more, but kind of, you know, it, it just exploits what is there in the information that is there in the additional several hundred uh, tests. But the contact tracing is going down faster as I am using more and more tests. And the mean field estimation of, of the um, uh, risk is going down even faster. So here we are seeing that with sufficiently many tests, we can diminish the epidemics much faster. So what sufficiently many means in practice, we would have to go you know, to population sizes and more real, even more realistic uh, kind of uh, parameters. So that's basically on, our, on, on my uh, next slide, what we are working on right now is going to larger networks so that we can look at yet more realistic epidemic spreading models that you know where really few individuals are are actually infected networks of million nodes you know next thing we we didn't yet implement this uh, this control of the epidemic together with the with the brownstein belief propagation algorithm that was doing the best on the on the rock curve comparisons so we are really excited and waiting to get that we need to explore the role of the various parameters because I was showing you those graphs and not really going into the detail of all those parameters that were listed there. But it's of course, you know, there are several of them. It's of course important to know their role and include more info from the simulator because the simulator, for instance, includes age groups and who is living in the same household and details about the syndromes that we are not so far included in the inference model. So this would provide additional information and additional kind of performance and prediction uh, and performance. And we also kind of need to be learning the parameters. So far, we are doing it a bit by hand, trying a number of them. And that also goes to my last slide now, like what's next? So actually going back to the to what Joshua Benjo was telling us five weeks ago, and you know, I have been following their progress at the Mila. You actually can learn not only the parameters of the common SIR model, but you actually could think about learning the whole model in a in a you know very much uh, AI, a modern machine learning, deep uh, learning way using graph neural networks. And interestingly, it's something that just a few days ago Max Melling was also you know posting about on Facebook for people who are interested in that. Next thing that also needs to be done is that so far we were assuming the contact network is known perfectly, but if we want to implement the app in a privacy preserving way, then the contact network will not be known perfectly. So including that into the implementation is a, you know, is an important kind of factor and needs to be understood and tested. So, you know, let me know if you want to work with us. All that I have been telling you about, you can read about it at the Git repository and try those notebooks or on the overleaf where are our notes. And I guess that brings us to the question time. <laughs>